Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to our Kawasa series of webinars for water operators of Kawasa membership. Uh, this afternoon, we are joined by our special guests of the Operators Without Borders, um, including Valerie Jenkinson, Madeline Butch, and uh, our guest presenter, Mr. Ronald Enns. And he has presented for us before. Um, he is the manager of the business development for Quantlin Polytechnic University, specializing in continuing education and new course development. He holds an adult instructional certificate from CityLearn, a Rescue Services College, and Rescue Services Instructional Certificate from Manitoba Emergency Services College, and is a 2012 Citation Award recipient in recognition of exemplary service as a member of the Insagard, Insarag Canada Task Force One. Ron is also an executive board member of the British Columbia Common Ground Alliance, a member of the BC One Call Membership Resource Committee and Deployment and Education Committee for Operators Without Borders, a nonprofit organization that deploys to Caribbean hurricane disaster countries providing essential drinking water and restoration services. Ron holds the following Canadian Rescue Services Certifications, FR3, Con okay. Confined Space Rescue 2, Rope Rescue 2, Trench Rescue 2, Structural Collapse Rescue 2, ICS 100-200, that is Incident Command System 100-200, and FEMA Task Force Leader, and I should also let you know that he was on the team that went down from Canada to assist the United States during Hurricane Katrina. And which is why he, as a wastewater specialist, and which is why he would like to share this experience with us. And having had that experience in Hurricane Katrina, which devastated um, the, the eastern part of the United States. And so we're happy to have you on board, Ron. And the floor is yours. Ah, excellent. Thank you very much, Ignatius. Um, uh, and uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm hoping to uh, focus this as much as possible to uh, lessons learned. Um, and hopefully it can be as much related to um, what everyone else has uh, potentially gone through or is going to be going through. Um, and try to give you some resources, tips, and tricks. So. Um, I'll just uh, hit to the next slide here. So uh, the INSERAG group is the International Security uh, Search and Rescue Advisory Group. Um, all of our teams across Canada are registered through INSERAG, which is the United Nations um, Task Force. Um, and most teams all across the world are in, in joint membership for them. Um, so I was, uh, I was part of that team up till to 2014 when I uh, uh, resigned from the team because I actually moved uh, away from that area into the university where I could not do both at the same time. So uh, that's the reason why I left the team. Um, I was actually brought on to the team. I was uh, a member of the team when they went to Katrina, but I did not go to Katrina. Um, I was uh, actually brought on as a wastewater specialist and uh, advised and worked with the crew post-rescue after Katrina, uh, interviewing and looking at all the lessons learned. Um, and I was brought in as a subject matter expert uh, just because I was a water and wastewater specialist. Um, and I already was uh, trench rescue certified and had some of the rescue uh, certifications prior to that. So, um, so I just wanted to, to kind of give you a quick, quick update on that. So, um, but, uh, but I'm definitely NFPA 1006 and 1670. Um, uh, uh, I'm rescue uh, member, leadership committee, et cetera. Um, and I've uh, been through all that experience. So, so anyway, that's, that's basically me. Um, so tops uh, that I'd like to talk about and hopefully it'll help you out is uh, Hurricane Katrina. We're going to go through just a few slides of what happened in Hurricane Katrina. Most of you may already know that and or also, also, uh, also have your own stories uh, around, you know, hurricanes that may have uh, gone through your area. Um, we're going to talk about some of the uh, problems during that rescue operation. Um, and also we're going to talk about uh, some of the com or we're going to talk about the comments that the rescuers had, especially in our interview process 
um, as I helped uh, go through all the post comments and and uh, and help you know uh, upgrade the team and learn lessons you could say. Um, we're going to talk about hurricane preparation. We're going to talk about the general planning around that. Um, we're, we talk about municipal planning because I got highly involved within the municipal planning for the event. Um, so I was on, uh, on many um, leadership boards talking about that. And then we're going to do question and answers. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping for a lot of uh, questions at the end. So one of the questions I'd like you to consider um, while you're listening to this presentation is in your plan, in your hurricane disaster response plan, what is your first priority? Keep this in mind as we discuss this uh, towards the end of the presentation. So in your plan currently, what, what's your first priority? What are your first one, two, three? This, these are the things that we need to do. If a hurricane's on its way and we need to prepare for it, what do we need to do? Um, and I'm gonna ask that same question at the end and hopefully maybe there might be some additionals to it, maybe some add-ons to it, or maybe um, the same ones, but we'll, we'll find out when we get through that. So first we'll talk about Hurricane Katrina. Um, this. Uh, Hurricane uh, was a category five, um, did hit the Bahamas uh, and did some damage there, hit the tip of Florida, did some damage there. But the main part of the damage is when it actually hit Louisiana and mostly because it just wasn't prepared. When it hit uh, New Orleans, the city itself, uh, there was a lot of unexpected things that happened. Uh, this is the first really big major heavier hurricane to hit in that type of force with that type of water swell um, in as long as most people can remember. By the time it did actually hit the coast, it was a category three. So it had lost some power, but it did gain some power in the Caribbean itself. So that the edge of it did come in at, at, a, at a five and then a four and a three as the eye passed over. So, and it did a lot of damage. It actually still is one of the few, one of the highest damaging hurricanes uh, on the list of, uh, of world disasters. So the flooding uh, in the protection system, um, as that hurricane came on, um, it flooded out the city of New Orleans and burying them under 80% of water. Um, St. Bernard Parish is where our team actually ended up, um, was uh, completely underwater. Um, there was no land on that part of it. Um, and uh, it was largely due to not just the water swell and not just the surge as, as, the, uh, as the waters came inland, uh, but it was because New Orleans is already a low-lying area, uh, it was already susceptible to these type of surges. And then when the actual levees or dike system that keeps the uh, Mississippi and the, and the ocean away, um, ended up failing and that's where a lot of the major water came in and it took almost a week before it finally dissipated enough that we can do ground search. Um, the deployment of the team, um, uh, um, thanks to uh, WestJet for us uh, who actually was able to ship us down there, but uh, the team was lucky in this case to actually respond to this because it was the only Canadian team that responded and it was the only team there 24 hours before any FEMA team hit the ground. We were the first and only team for the first day of, of uh, of actual rescue. Um, and that just a uh, simple reason is, is that it happened to be that our task force leader at the, uh, at the time, uh, Tim Armstrong, um, actually had this personal cell phone for the state of Louisiana governor um, and actually called him and asked for assistance. He said, yes, can we make it official? Yes, we called Pep and, and everything else. And that's kind of how the team actually got deployed. So on August 31st, the team was actually deployed, 45 members, and they were sent to St. Bernard Parish as being the worst disaster area at the time. So the team arrived at the parish, and as you can see the picture, uh, for those that uh, will see this later, um, there was, by the time the team arrived there, there was anywhere from about three to 10 feet of water um, covering uh, the whole area. So there was not a strip of land that was actually dry. Um, it, was, it was quite a shock. Uh, people were already evacuated as many that could during the storm. Uh, many were on, on causeways uh, that were above or higher than the, the ground. Many of them were, were in uh, uh, other uh, areas um, that, uh, that were actually uh, designated as uh, safe zones, um, including uh, I think most people have seen the, one of the uh, stadiums that was completely full of people. Um, so the team itself had 10 days of supplies when they set up. 30% of the population was feared missing at this time. Um, they had no, uh, no reports from St. Bernard Parish because there was totally no power, no, no way to get in, um, although we did finally get in. And the team, uh, Tim, or sorry, team leader, which is Tim Armstrong at the time, said every square inch of this real estate was underwater. The devastation was beyond any comprehension. And it was, it was, uh, it was a very emotional piece for a lot of the guys as, as we went through the interview process. Um, the team, uh, um, we're, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what, what they went through uh, as we go through, but the team returned uh, home on September 5th. So really technically they're only there for a few days of, uh, of actual uh, um, rescue. Um, they ended up treating 200, just over 250 people 
um, and they rescued, uh, I've heard anywhere from 112 to 125, depending on who you talk to, because again, um, records were a little bit difficult and hard to, I don't know, hard to keep track of. Um, and everybody had a little bit different story because depending on who you classify as rescued and who, who is classified as not needing rescue, but was there. So there's numbers you'll see from, from 119 all the way to 125, all depending on, on who you talk to. So the, because of the water, it was a very difficult search. Those first three days were very difficult for most people. Um, the water was, was uh, high and they had to do all their searches through boat. Uh, it wasn't until the last day before some of the areas were accessible by foot. And at that point in time, that's when they were deemed they can go home. Because uh, once, once uh, people can go on foot and do the searches, most of the FEMA teams came in and kind of took over. And by that time, honestly, our city of Vancouver team was exhausted because um, they've been doing long hours, long days, very little sleep, high temperatures, high humidity. It was not, it was not the best case scenario for them. So just want to give you a quick brief of what happened. But really, uh, I want to talk about lessons learned and, and what happened during that, that period. So problems during the rescue. Um, well, you know, as some of the pictures you've seen and, and uh, again, see here, is um, 100,000 people were trapped in that city. Um, and most of them were not prepared for what was gonna happen. Even FEMA was not prepared for what was gonna happen. Um, there were some warnings went out, but that was it. There were only issued warnings. A lot of people were trapped, didn't realize the, what was gonna happen. Of course, nobody realized the levees were gonna fail either. So a lot of them didn't have any private transportation, they didn't have any way to get out before the water came in. And when it came in, most people were stuck on their rooftops. They didn't know what else to do. They didn't know where else to go. They couldn't swim anywhere. Um, so thousands of people were short of, of food and drink and medical supplies. Um, you know, I always say the important things that we need to survive in life is air, water, and food. Um, so we, air, we can't survive. Uh, we can only survive minutes without air. We can survive uh, three, a few days without water, and we can only survive a week without food. So those are our primary things. And of course, shelters also obviously built into that as well. And many of them didn't with the hot heat and, and the sun and no shade, and they're stuck on their roof where you know, a lot of cases was even hotter than normal, uh, it was, there was no relief for them. So this fur further aggravated all the um, problems that were happening. And it wasn't just the people, there was also a lot of shootings, hijacking, uh, hijackings, and carjackings, and thefts. Um, even the team itself, when they went down there, um, we actually ended up getting a U-Haul. Uh, we borrowed a uh, Jeep, and I do mean borrow because we did return it with a note, um, and full of gas. Um, we borrowed a Jeep, we borrowed uh, a few boats that were actually given to us by the state troopers. Um, and in order to do our rescue. Um, so it was a lot of things that did happen. And, and the other thing, well, we'll talk a little bit more about it as we get further in here. Um, other problems during that rescue, um, near completion of the breakdown was communication. And, and I can't say it enough, uh, communication is very important. And, and as we talk a little bit later on about how this affects your environment, your municipality, your city, your country, um, yeah, you can see the importance of it, but communication is the biggest thing. Without communication, if you can't communicate with rescuers, um, with uh, any of your, uh, people who supply you the logistics, communications, or sorry, the logistics, the finance for the operation, authorizations from higher up, um, you're really limited to what you can do. Yeah, very limited. Uh, and unfortunately, our team, again, was limited. Uh, when we ended up there the first day, we had no communication. It took us another day or two, or another day before we actually got communication. And then it was short, short band radios, and it was only limited. Um, so, but uh, our, even our satellite phones were problems, um, but although they're available, but a lot of people are jammed up. Handheld radios were available, but again, they get useless after the batteries run out because we had no power. So there's no way to charge the system. So these are the things that, uh, that uh, don't always uh, um, expect. Um, we had a lot of problems um, and, I, and that was the main reason why they brought me on was a lot of dead animals, rotting vegetation, mold, sewage, chemicals lay within these flooded areas. And they didn't know what to do with this stuff. They didn't know, you know, can we cook it? Can we boil it? Can we purify it? What are we going to do with this stuff? Or, or, you know, and if it contaminates us and contaminates everyone else, how are we going to decontaminate? Or are we bringing that into, you know, into our environment? Um, so there's a lot of questions, and uh, um, that and that kind of uh, brought me aboard. Um, very hot again, very humid, which again, you know, is great for bacteria growth and 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 the rest. Um, the weather uh, obviously slowed down the efforts. The water flooding obviously slowed down the efforts. And one of the greatest, greatest problems uh, in the response was complication over lines of authority. And, and if, I don't know if you recall, but after this whole thing, disaster ended, they completely revamped FEMA simply because at this time FEMA failed. They didn't anticipate that this could happen to this degree and the FEMA system wasn't solid in place. And that's probably how we snuck in underneath the, the uh, radar really. Um, during the storm, the surges, the floodings, um, they, they overwhelmed the uh, sewage uh, infrastructure. Um, they overwhelmed everything. Um, so, Good way to look at this, if you get a lot of storm surge coming in, 
uh, it's going to fill up um, all the manhole systems, the CB systems. It's going to fill your, your sewer systems. It, your, your sewer um, infrastructure is going to get flooded out. Your, your treatment uh, um, ponds, your treatment lagoons are going to get flooded out and over their banks. This stuff is going to be everywhere. Uh, treatment plants, plants are going to be out of commission. Um, there's, even if you have generator backup, chances are it's not going to be even effective anyway because you're going to be pumping pipe that's going to have more than 100% capacity already in it and you don't know where to pump it at too. So that's the other piece because of the flooding, you'll be pumping it right out into the open. So a lot, a lot of issues uh, were happening around that um, and unfortunately a lot of people had no water. So guess where they were going for their water? They, had, they were just reaching down and, and drinking whatever they could find. Um, and that became a, a law, a big problem, especially with health concerns. And in the short term, you know, might be able to get away before you get too sick, but in the long term, people are going to really seriously get hurt or die. A lot of life-threatening uh, pathogens are carried by sewage, you know, cholera and typhoid. You guys know all this dysentery, right? Other diseases um, could uh, include hep A and other infectious and numerous ones. And then, of course, the fecal from E. coli. I mean, there's so much out there. And if people don't truly understand how to, how to do it or how to treat it, we get into a problem. I mean, uh, as you know from uh, the uh, CDC or the uh, uh, um, uh, disease control, um, understanding that, that uh, water, fresh water is very important and bottled water is, is obviously the best. But how to treat it? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. So a lot of things happen with the sewage system um, and a lot of sewage failures. And of course, now our wells are being flooded out too with, with this water, mixed water flooding and sewer. So our water is contaminated as well. So you can't even rely upon water systems coming through uh, that are going to be clean. And in some cases, depending on the severity of the, uh, of the disaster, you may not even have water systems. So a lot of the uh, rescuers, I just wanted to show you a quick little video um, of uh, some of the comments that were made. Um, you can listen to it um, or watch it depending on where you are. I'm just gonna share the video. Um, this is a YouTube video it came out, just a very short three minute video from CBC News. And this is uh, about 10 years after the fact on the same rescuers that we ended up uh, interviewing. And let's see, hopefully, oops. Just gonna double check I did that right because I want you guys to be able to hear it. That's the most important part. Share your sound, share the video, you're good to go. And here we go. You know, they'd hug you and kiss you, but when they'd see our, our insignia and, and realize we were from Canada, they were shocked that, uh, you know, teams from Canada or Vancouver were the first ones to make it to Southern Louisiana. It was civil unrest, um, it was chaos. And uh, even as a police officer, to try and fathom that and try and get my, my head around what was going on, surreal is the only, the only term I could use. The caskets floating in the submerged uh, cemeteries, the hydronic pressure shoving the caskets up out of the ground and disturbing uh, crypts. That was just bizarre. You could see them bobbing. Just one of the gentlemen, he didn't want to leave anything in his house and, and took a long time to convince him. But and you look in the house and it was just mold, like it was like mold a foot deep. It's very tough, you know, when you're dealing with that grief, you know, and not only the death aspect of it, um, but the grief dealing with these people, like I said, that have, have lost everything. Despite what I saw, despite what I experienced, um, I'm very happy and proud that I was able to be part of the team and to contribute the way I did. So there's a quick, quick little um, um, video of uh, uh, just uh, four of the responders that were actually there, um, which I got an opportunity to work with most of them, except for Bob, he's the only one that actually left the uh, team shortly after. Um, but uh, that was our 10th anniversary, and it was four members uh, that recalled it, some of their experiences, and, and just like you mentioned, um, uh, Tim was mentioning from the BC Ambulance Service, uh, you know, about caskets and stuff like that, and these are the things that you don't always think about. Um, not to mention septic field, septic field uh, infiltration and septic tanks. If they're half empty, they're going to be air, they're going to be bobbing, they're going to be coming out of the ground. If we could further contaminate the system, um, you know, there's so many things. And one of the f other things that, you know, most people didn't think about too is people wanted to get out, but a lot of them left their animals and their pets behind. And that really caused another issue and another problem. So it, it was, uh, it was quite an emotional for, for a lot of the guys that we interviewed. Um, but uh, it was, uh, it was, it was good to have a little video of just a few of the comments that they had mentioned. So, um, uh, Dan's still part of the team. Uh, Steve Fulmer definitely is. In fact, uh, we've, we've done a lot of training programs building uh, together for the JI or Justice Institute. And uh, Tim's a great guy. He's still around, but uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't work with the team as much anymore. Um, so some of the post comments, and these are the comments that came directly from, from uh, the rescuers as we were interviewing them. Um, one, one gentleman uh, said, uh, 
you know, there's apparent lack of any sort of planning to utilize boats and how to put that strain on the rescue operation or how that put the strain on the rescue operation. Again, you know, they weren't prepared for the levees to, to go and they weren't prepared for the water and they weren't prepared for it to stay and, and have these people stranded. So, so getting there, they, they had to do a lot of beg, steal and borrow to try to get enough boats so they can do as enough uh, rescue as possible. Um, victims returned to our site without any apparent pre-planning for medical aid or evacuation plans from that point. So the only small spit of land that was close to St. Bernard Parish, um, once they got there, what are they going to do? A lot of them said, okay, well, now that we're here, what do we do? Where do we go? And there was no means uh, of medical aid. There was no place that they could go. Uh, most of them were sent to the stadium. And if you remember pictures of what the stadium looked like, it was, it was so many people that couldn't even get in and it's just too many people in one spot. Um, at first, uh, we were pretty reluctant having anything to do with the media. And, and that was, uh, you know, much like you've heard of American and Canadian, our media system is much different. Um, America have the right, the media has the right to everything and anything at any time. Canada, we restrict certain things due to rescue operations. Um, down there, it's not such a case. It's a bit more relaxed there. And the media wanted to be a part of this. Um, so, you know, of course, our rescuers are very, you know, reluctant on that and didn't really expect that because that's not part of what we do in Canada. Yeah, most of our media will stay back, let the rescuers do their part after three or four days, then they come in and then they, they do their media piece. But after a while, um, meeting with FEMA, they started to see some problems and uh, started to sort out some of the problems. And uh, we thought that if the media are good, we'll let them come, uh, come with us. And that good just means is behavior. If they can come in and well, be, well behave, stay out of our way, allow us to do the rescue, um, then the team will allow them to go in there because FEMA was quite adamant at that point to allow media in there because that was the American way. Um, so that is what happened. And in, in most cases, the media actually were quite cooperative. In some cases, they put the cameras down to help. So they, they became part of the, uh, of the actual rescue process in some cases. Also, one of the comments were uh, we made sure that every contact that we made with the survivors was documented. No other team was doing this. And that was the other thing. We always document everything that we do. Um, other teams were rescuing, but there was no numbers. We had numbers of people and, you know, our number list was over 250 people as how many people we saw and out of rescue, like I said, anywhere from about 112 up to 125, all depending on who you talk to. Some of the other post comments from, uh, from the rescuers themselves is it was not the typical type of work that you'd expect from a team of like us to be trained in. Um, so you got to remember we're a heavy urban search and rescue team. So we come in under large natural disasters where um, local first responders like the police, ambulance, fire are overwhelmed. The, it's such a big disaster, they can't handle it. That's when the USAR team comes in. So we're good for, and, and our team especially, since we're out of Vancouver, um, we obviously don't get hurricanes here. Um, we don't even get tornadoes out here. Um, but what we do do is we have earthquake issues and we have tsunami uh, uh, issues and we have flooding issues because um, we're on a floodplain here in the Vancouver. Um, so we do have those things. So we're, we're trained in those type of things, swift waters and other things we're trained in. We're trained in landslides because British Columbia has over a thousand landslides every year and many of them um, end up in, in uh, residential or, or uh, owned property where people are buried or, or hurt or injured. Um, avalanches, those are the type of things that we're trained to respond in, not so much avalanches, that's another specialty area, but it's mostly earthquakes and flooding uh, and, um, and, and landslides and those type of things. So it was a little bit different for us to come into this type of circumstance where it was uh, ocean water come in and the flooding was a little bit different than our freshwater flushing, flooding system. So there's a lot of things that we um, weren't quite prepared for. Um, several of the team members, uh, um, so here's another comment is uh, several team members on the team hotwired tractors, trucks, cars to acquire transportation to move out of the area. These vehicles would then be returned where they were found after serving their purpose. Um, and like I mentioned, yeah, we, we seconded quite, they seconded quite a few vehicles to transport these people. Once the water started to recede, we now had roadways where they can drive them off to the stadium and stuff like that. So, and, and that's a specialty. I mean, who, who thinks about, oh, we should probably train our, our, our rescuers and how to hotwire vehicles. Not something you'd be thinking about. Um, but in actual fact, most of our guys, and, and like me, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a small I'm a small engine mechanic, um, you know, so I, I grew up, my dad's a mechanic, so I had to grow up fixing cars. So I, I'm one of those guys that could easily hot wire a vehicle if I had to. Not that I do. Please understand, I wouldn't do that. However, um, but those are the type of skills that suddenly you realize you need these skills that you didn't have before, um, which is kind of odd when you think about it, but it's a unique way to look at it. One of the other, one of the other rescuers also said is one of the problems encountered was lack of knowledge that people had for the disaster. They had no communication with the outside. So not only were we struggling with communication, but they had no power. They had no way to communicate with the outside. They had no telephone, no cell, because cell towers were overwhelmed as well. They're out. 
Um, so there was nothing that they, so they had no idea. In, in many cases, um, uh -oh, well here, one responder said they couldn't understand. They couldn't fathom the water. They thought that the flooding was on their street or maybe a street or two over and that the city was gonna come and pump it all out. It was just plain disbelief. A lot of people were just, you, can, you know, I, I can't believe that the entire city or 80% of the city was flooded. Um, so there wasn't enough preparation. People weren't under enough training or knowledge or understanding of what would happen or could potentially happen. And sometimes those things do happen. But we try to prepare as best we can. Um, but uh, but it, uh, and there was actually a few, um, again, uh, states is a little bit more on the gun carrying where we in Canada do not respond with guns. <laughs> um, and, and our gun laws are much different. Um, but down there, they have the right to own uh, guns. And a lot of them uh, basically would refuse to leave their house and they'd point a gun at you and say, nope, sorry, you're not coming near me. And it's okay, no problem. So how many people got in the house? What's your name? I'll record it. Thank you very much. Have a good day. We can carry on. Um, the other comments were um, from the rescuers were the lessons I learned from Katrina was all about preventing health from the team, our, our preventative health for the team, and taking care of the team and maintaining our functionality. That's a very important part. I mean, if your team gets sick, there's no rescue capabilities. Then you're part of the victims or part of the patients. We can't do that. Rescuers have to be. They're, they're an important essential part of the rescue without them being in top condition, rested, ready to operate, well-fed and, and hydrated, they can't do their job. And you gotta remember this is under high stress. So first responders are high stress uh, responders and they have to deal with this high, high stress and that's what makes them such good members. So that's a definite challenge. Um, Another uh, um, uh, rescuer mentioned, because of the restrictions to our cash, we didn't have enough medical supplies to treat very many people. I think the, tri uh, the triage somewhere between 300 to 400 patients while the squads were out there on the first day. So three to 400 people came through that area. Um, not all we treated, we treated about 250 in total. Um, but 300 to 400 people came, came there because it was the only part of dry land close by. And they were hungry, they, they wanted medical help, they didn't have any pills, they didn't have you know, any of their own medical, uh, medical supplies. They were they, they were distraught. They needed stuff and, and we didn't know where to point them. We had our cash, but we didn't have cash for all these people as well. I'd, uh, another comment was, I'd say that the biggest factor that affected most of the people was that none of us were prepared for the, for the pets. And, and like I talked about earlier is the animals. There was a lot of pets left behind and you know, it was a lot of heartbroken for these guys that they, in some cases couldn't do anything for these pets. I mean, they can't, what are you going to do? You grab a pet, you bring it back. What are you going to do with the pet? A lot of cases they had to triage and triage means is we either rescue 12 of those people over there or we rescue 10 of these pets over here. And they had to decide which one was more important. And it was heartbreaking for a lot of the guys. Um, next on Mike phones, communication was very short range, occasionally compromised uh, um, field operations. So even the mics that they end up getting from that were shipped down for them to use were still very short range. Um, so they weren't able to get very far until they lost contact. So it was a, it was a, uh, it definitely hampered the, uh, the rescue efforts. Um, our Houston team had, uh, another member said, our Houston our team had contracted Global Star uh, for satellite voice data services. However, Global Star had sold all of their bandwidth to the media. And that posed another problem. We didn't expect that. Um, and because of that, we had to start getting our own frequencies and our own bandwidths and have our own suppliers already with contract um, because of, of one of these reasons. I mean, Global Star is huge. They, they, they're one of the ones that most people will go to when it comes to getting emergency radios and, and being able to use their bandwidth. But if, but the media wanted it, we can't do anything about that because they're an independent company. So we didn't have an agreement with them prior to a disaster like this. Say, hey, in a, in a disaster, we need a certain percentage of that. That was never there. So that, that became a big problem. That's where it came to the satellite phones and stuff where we didn't have full access with our satellite phones. They weren't always working. And it was only in the evenings that we actually had access to anything. Um, and the daytime, it was all, it was all bandwidth was gone. So, you know, all these different things that you, that you don't really think about. Um, so another of the comments was, uh, you can't pull a rescue squad who's just been out on the field for 12 hours and expect them to come back and make their own dinner and do all those kinds of things. Uh, it was one of the other things is we didn't have our own support. So the rescuers were out there doing the work. They're out there for 12 hours. They come back and they're exhausted. They're tired. Uh, and now they had to make their own dinner, make their own cot, do their own laundry, clean themselves up, take showers, you know, and there's no support there. So there's no camp support. Um, you know, 45 members, honestly, for, if you look at it from, from a, uh, if you look at it from ICS 100, 200 standpoint, um, you have a hundred rescuers out of that hundred rescuers, you're lucky to get 20 to 30 that are actually going to be rescuers. The rest are support. Those are your logistics. Those are your financial. Those, those are your, 
your communications people, you know, those are your medical people. There's all of these support structures just to help those. So it's usually a two thirds, three quarters of the team is support for the rescuers who are actually out there. So important piece to keep in mind. Um, one of the comments was, is there was further dangers presented by wildlife. There were alligators, copperhead snakes, water moccasins, which are cotton moths. Um, so there's a lot of dangers out there too. And a lot of these, not only the alligators, uh, they're unfortunately they're feeding on a lot of things out there. Um, but these snakes uh, were all over the place um, because then was a new environment. So it was, it was a real problem with the, with the rescuers. They didn't have that understanding and knowledge, local understanding and knowledge. Um, other dangers were hydroelectric stations in the water. There was a lot of hydroelectric stations in the water and every now and then the system would click on and click off and you could hear. And the guys were saying, it's like, oh shit, it's panic. And then it was the hydro system. They're still trying to engage the hydro system. And I don't know what the details were behind that. Um, but uh, they kept hearing the clicks and electricity clicking and clicking off and clicking on and clicking off. Um, and it didn't happen all day. It just happened on occasions. So I think they were trying to engage the system. But when you're in water, as you know, water's not a very good uh, insulator, but it's a great conductor. So definitely some issues. So I kind of takes care of most of the post comments um, that, uh, that everyone uh, had. And I kind of highlighted the ones that were more related, I hope. Um, the other thing was about it was team safety. And, and this is kind of why um, they help bring a guy like myself in. So I'm a water operator and a sewer operator. So I kind of have both aspects of it. So one of the considerations was given to is drinking water supply. They were very concerned about it and the exposures that they had to a lot of these hazards. Um, because um, St. Bernard Parish is home to a lot of, a lot of oil refineries. And, and because of all the flooding out, even in the oil refineries, that means oil was on there, fuel was floating in there plus all the toxic chemicals from, from other things, not just from, from chemical plants, um, from commercial plants, from residential, from people have containers and paint and stuff lying around that all got mixed in. And this became a, a, a big hazardous materials waste bath. Um, so every time they're out there, um, they had to be concerned about this. And the people they're picking up, how much contamination were they? So they were, they were contaminated from head to toe, yet the only thing they could think of to clean themselves was their boots. Um, so they're bringing a lot of that contamination right into the camp and into, you know, their, their medical area, um, which was, which is a big eye opener for a lot of them because they just didn't fully understand it. Medical team had a better understanding and they were trying to keep everyone at bay, but we we're limited in, in what we could do. Um, so it, it was, uh, it was definitely quite overwhelming. Uh, one of the responders said is we're dealing with contaminated waters, big oil leaks, bacteria, viruses, you name it. After the hurricane, there was 30 feet of mud, muddy water. So everything had a form of mold and mycotoxins. So there's mold growing everywhere, as we know what those what the dangers of mold and spores are. So uh, lots, lots of uh, health issues uh, that, uh, that they were encountering. So, um, so some of the lessons learned. Um, so now we kind of talked about what their responses were, kind of what they did. Now we're going to get more into what did they learn? What, what did they start putting as in priority? How did they change their priority list? Because just, just like yourselves, we had to change our priority list. So the disaster responding to. So number one, know the disaster. Know what can happen. What are the potentials? You know, what do you have in the area that could be flooded out? And what are we going to do? Um, examine the history. So what's happened in the past? Not only in your area, but what has happened in the local area that's very similar to your area? And learn from the others. Like these are three very important things. First, need to know the disaster um, and understand what, what could potentially happen in that disaster. Examine the history of, of what has happened in the past to other areas or your own area, and then learn. Not just learn from your own mistakes, learn from other mistakes. Um, I like to go around and find out what everyone else did wrong because that way when I do it, I can learn from their mistakes. So there's a great resource and I have a tier. If you don't have the slide, uh, uh, please ask for it and we can send it to you. Um, but it's uh, hurricane preparedness through the we uh, weather.gov uh, government. Uh, has great hurricane preparedness information around uh, um, public hurricane kits that the public can have, as well a little bit of work on the municipal end. And we're gonna talk about that shortly. Um, so big thing is, is everyone needs supplies, right? And again, we always talk about the three most main things you need is air, water, and shelter, but air, water, food, shelter, right? Gotta, gotta keep those in mind. So. Hurricane kits with everything you need to survive uh, more than three days, preferably five. Strengthen your home. Um, that's a possibility you can do too. You can cover your, your boards up with wind or your windows with boards. Um, you can put uh, sandbags around to, to, you know, and these are preparations. They don't always work, but they help. Um, you can strengthen your home interior for, for any type of earthquakes or anything like that. You can, there's different types of strapping you can put on your, on your uh, members. Um, insurance is a big thing too. And ID, you know, make sure you have a second place for ID or know where your ID is. If disaster happens, you can grab it because you got to prove who you are too. 
Um, and you want to make sure your, your insurance is up to date. Check your insurance, make sure it's up to date, and it'll cover you. And you can ask, okay, if I have this type of disaster, what is my insurance policy? What would, what, what, what would it cover? And that's a good thing to keep it up to date. Get a plan together. So it could be in your home plan or municipal plan, but we're talking to home right now, is get your plan together for your own home, for your own people. Um, I always used to say too, I'm out rescuing somebody else, but if something happens, so if I have, there's a disaster in my hometown, and I, although I'm trained to respond to that disaster, I'm not going to be responding to that disaster because my number one consideration is not going to be everyone else. It's going to be my own family. So I'm going to protect my own family. So if a disaster happens in your area, don't think that your team is the one that's going to respond to it. Chances are it's going to be the team next door. It's going to be the team that's outside the disaster. It's going to come in and help you. Okay. So keep that in mind, right? It only makes logical sense. Um, we did a quick tabletop exercise. 80 rescuers respond. Out of that, we only actually 15 showed up. Reason being is because only 15 had their families taken care of or didn't have enough family to worry about or their family were out of town and they were here by themselves. So they were willing to respond and help. But no one's going to respond. They're going to take care of their family first. Then they're going to take care of everyone else. Okay. So that's always a good thing when you're, when you're looking, working on a plan. Um, the other thing is, uh, is shelters and assembly area. Like find a shelter and assembly area and know in your, your, um, in your area where you live, where's the high ground, where's the nearest shelter, where's the nearest resources, how long is it going to take to get there? And if something comes, what, how much time is it going to take me to get there? Right? So you need to think about all those things. <clears throat> um, make plans with international country and municipal resources. Okay? Contact people, find out where all the resources are and what you can do and where you can go and where you can contact. If you're looking at it from this municipal aspect, make sure your, your country, municipality, your city, um, we have a list of all those people that have resources that can help us. We want to make sure that we have those resources available. When it does happen, you're on speed dial. We know who to call, we know who to contact, and we know what we need to get that ball rolling, especially when it comes to support. And incident command training, I can't say it enough. ICS training 100, 200, 300, or 400, uh, depending on your level and depending on, on what you're trying to do, is a real necessity. And, and, and thanks to um, Kawasa ready for, for doing several of the uh, incident command courses because that gives your incident command training system is a well-recognized uh, North America, part of South America, Brazil, um, Mexico, all rely upon the ICS system, the incident command system. And that system is just a simple structured system um, that gives you clear responsibilities of if a disaster happens, this is kind of how it's going to work. And it gives you kind of a framework that you can work with to build into your emergency plans. Okay, so that's what it is. So ICS 100 is basic, basic. 200 is for people who are supervisory roles, squad leaders, that type of thing, or, or uh, getting into operations. 300, these are your operations level people. These are your logistics, communications, uh, managers, uh, those type of people. And uh, FEMA uh, task force leaders is 300, 400. That's when you become your, your, uh, your leader where you're dealing with all of that. So determine your risks in your area and build a plan. That's one of the most important things. Find out what your risks are, find out what other people have done, build a plan. Um, general plan, um, stock up resources um, in a safe hurricane proof area. Um, a, lot of a lot of things we've done around here for hurricane or for earthquakes, which you can do for hurricanes as well. We've got a lot of, of uh, steel shipping containers and we've loaded them up with supplies that can last up to five years. And then we, every five years, empty it out, rotate it out, put new supplies in there, get rid of the old supplies. And that's an ongoing thing. And we have these containers all over the lower mainland, all strategically placed in high ground areas and safe areas. <clears throat> and that way we know as a, as a municipality or a city, and even as a public works resource, that we know where to go and what to do. Um, and it's not just for the survivors, it's for the rescuers too. So don't forget the rescuers need supplies as much as survivors do. So we got to think about both rescuers and survivors going there. Um, assume you will not have the following. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. One other thing I want to talk about is, and where you store it. Is it going to be at home? Is it going to be at work? If you're storing stuff at home and it's going, you're in a flooded area, you're going, to, you're going to want to store it high. If you're in an earthquake area, you're going to take it out of the house. And you're going to put it in a shed outside that's earthquake proof. So we got to think about what, what's your disaster and what's the safest area and where you can put your supplies. Assume that you're going to have no electricity, no municipal water, no drainage systems whatsoever. It's going to be flood. No cable, no telephone, no natural gas, no propane no fuel of any kind. It's going to be portable fuel. And you're now going to have to survive and cook and do everything you need to do. So consider all of that gone. So if it's gone, what are you going to do? Uh, think also, you're going to have no means of communication. You're going to have no TV. So it's pretty simple. Chances are you're not going to have that. 
Um, you're going to have GPS, but then so is everyone else. And in an emergency response, they take up the bandwidth. So you got to keep that in mind too. Shelter. You're going to have no shelter. Your, health, your house is going to be a danger to you for health reasons. You're not wanting to go into your house, which means you might be living outside. It could be when the water drains away. It could be a tent. It could be tarps. It could be a shed. Who knows? It could be, you know, a travel trailer or whatever that may be. It all depends on what you have. Um, but so you got to think about your shelter. And I always say lots of tarps. Transportation, you're not going to have a way to get off or away. So you're going to have to have three to five days worth of food, water, medical supplies, okay, and shelter. No medical help for first responders arrive. So you're not going to have any medical help until those responders arrive. When they respond, then they're going to be able to help you. How much can help you? Who knows, depending on how big the, the disaster is. But you will need, and I always say is the three, well, there's three and four, air, water, food, and Sorry. Okay, um, so you will need is generator with fuel, batteries, uh, water, foods, food, means of cooking or boiling water, right? Because you got to think about that too. Boiling the water for normal stuff. Use your, your, your saved water for drinking only. Medications, um, pandemic precautions, right? So we've got this COVID. It could be another different type of pandemic or something else. We're going to have to need to protect ourselves. It could be a lot of airborne viruses, not just COVID. It could be other different things out there, right? So we got to think about how we're going to make sure we're going to stay healthy. And important paperwork, like ID insurance, like we talked about before. AM, FM radio with batteries, absolutely essential. That's That in most cases is going to be your disaster response is going to be your AM, FM radio. Satellite's a possibility, depending on uh, on GPS, depending on, on availability. Um, GPS responders, a possibility, but again, you can't totally rely upon that. Cell phone, yes. Power up, yes. Because eventually you're going to have cell phone power and eventually you'll be able to get on if some cell phone are going to work. So you still want to keep your cell phone available. Tarps, blankets, means a temporary shelter, for sure. You definitely gonna have that around. Um, getting into municipal planning. Think about the government agency and support and resources. So now we're thinking government-wide. What are we gonna do? What's the country's emergency response plan? What's our provincial? What's our municipal? What's, what's all of those plans put together? How can we get everyone together, talk about those plans to see who does what? So when a disaster happens, we know our roles within that uh, response. Um, and that could be emergency responders. What are they going to do? It could be public works. Because most public works are going to turn into emergency responders. And they're going to be clearing roads. They're going to be clearing uh, things out of the way. Um, because most of them are going to have that type of, uh, of training. Um, other important contact lists. You definitely need those uh, emergency response people. You need all those, those contacts. Proper training uh, is really good. Uh, risk and hazard assessment. Like assess all your hazards that will happen during that, that type of uh, um, plan. Um, get all those plans together. Um, and do a big assessment uh, on what you what you could do. I mean, you're not going to be able to do a whole plan, but you're going to do pieces of it and put priority in that, those pieces. And what's the most important thing we need? Great, check those off first. Okay, next year we got a little bit of a budget. We'll do the next three. Okay, next year we'll do the next three, etc. You know, safe areas, stored supplies. Make sure you have communication with all involved. How are we going to communicate? And it could be just simply short short wave radios. That's that could be your only way of communicating. So you're going to be limited to only a kilometer and a half, two kilometers. That's it. Um, and do a tabletop exercise. That means pretend the disaster just happened, bring everybody into one room and let's work it out. And let's say, okay, if this does happen, who's going to respond? And then everybody's talking and pretend this, the, the disaster's there and you just tabletop exercise means you pretend it's happening, but you're doing it at a table, board table with a bunch of people who are responsible for certain areas. And that could be your emergency response people, your public works people, could be uh, your first responders, uh, respect representative for all the different responders from, from different medical uh, ambulance, fire, and police and have everyone there communicating and saying, this is what we're going to do. This is what we can do. This is our, this is our experience. This is what we have resources for. And that helps you prepare. Other considerations, depending on severity, um, help may not arrive for five or more days. It really depends on how bad it was. If it's really bad, it's going to take longer for people to respond. Um, but the biggest priority is, is communication systems, mobile communication systems, without communicating to your responders, to to any of your support systems or supports uh, uh, in place, you're not, you're not going to have, you're not going to have anything. Priorities are always going to be communication first. Second is going to be logistics. We got to make sure we can move around, right? Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. Hospitals are going to be the first place that's going to be hit first. We want to make sure the people that are sick are going to be taken care of. Schools, the children, those are next priorities. Make sure that they're going to be safe. Right, And then after that, we need access to all our resources to make sure we can reach the rest of the city and the rest of the public. So really when it comes down to the public, they're lower on the priority list than you may think. They're not that high on there. Hospital schools are. Hospitals for sure, because not only the people that are originally sick there, but people, once we rescue them, they got to go somewhere. And logistics is they got to get a means of way of getting there. So these are kind of your step-by-step -step list. 
protection from theft and vigilantes. Surprisingly, you don't think about that, but theft suddenly becomes a big problem. There's, there's 5% of that population or more or less, depending on where we are, you know, that that's what they think of. Oh, hey, this is a great opportunity. Let's take it. And they go out and they do what they do, which is really unfortunate. And then if, if help doesn't come in time, vigilante groups start being formed. You start getting new, new groups forming themselves saying, well, we can't rely upon them anymore. So we're doing it ourselves. And that, that can be just as much a problem too. So you got to take that into consideration. Um, medical triage locations, safe place to medical triage. All these people, as they come through, we got to be able to send them somewhere. And the transportation, that's back to your logistics, transportation of goods, supplies, rescuers, patients, um, leaders, media, you know, everybody's got to be able to have access to it. When they're rescuing Katrina, one of the biggest things they complained about was helicopters. There was always a helicopter in the air. And the people were so frustrated. They'd seen helicopters for three, four days straight flying over the head 24 seven, almost 24 seven. And no one had ever thought of stopping to help them out. And they felt very angry and frustrated. So a lot of the people that were being rescued were very, very angry and frustrated. And I mean, thankful that someone finally came, but they said, well, all these helicopters flying over, but no one's ever looking after me. So, you know, we got to think about those things. I always say is plan for success. If you don't plan, you're planning for failure. It's that simple. So um, we talked in the beginning about your, the question we asked is in your plan, in your hurricane disaster plan, what is your first priority? Now thinking about your one and two and third priority, do you think maybe they've changed now? Do you think maybe, hey, maybe communication is a bit more important. Maybe logistics and transportation, clearing those roads is more important. Maybe this is more important. And in your own home, maybe it's just air, water, food, shelter, you know, radio. Right. Hopefully those, those have given you some, something to think about. That was the whole point here is just to give you something more to think about uh, from both a, um, a perspective of being a, a resident stuck in a circumstance like this or being at the office in your public works department and sewers. And what are we going to do? You know, what's, what's going to be our role and what's going to be our responsibility. And at this point in time, I'm very open to any questions that you may have. Um, I haven't had a chance to, to check the chat, so I'm going to do that right now. So right, thank sharing. you, Ron. That that was really excellent production <clears throat> presentation. I, I think um, this is really timely, given that we're in the Caribbean in the middle of the hurricane season, and yes. once again, um, we're just reminded of some of the very important mm -hmm. things we need to consider our priorities um, during an event. Um, participants, the floor is yours. If you have questions, I haven't seen any in the chat. Just yet, yeah, two, three, if you should yeah, have any. One of my own would be, Please. you mentioned communications, and it's, it's one that always um, is a problem. Like even without a category one, the cell towers are down, and we, we've now become very dependent on using cell phones, and even for lots of messaging, um, using WhatsApp and these other social media. Yeah. Um, what sort of um, communication backup system do you use um, in, in the scenario like you had down in New Orleans? Yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up because that's one of my, my important ones that we, we actually change as a team. So we use short band radios. Um, so we use CVs, CB radio systems. So 40 channel CVs and handheld CV systems. Um, they're usually good for up to about six kilometers. Um, they're limited. Um, and they're readily available and it's an old technology that still is one of the only technologies you can use because it's, you don't need a frequency. It's free. Um, so CB, CB band radios are usually what we end up using or two-way radio systems. But if you use a CB, you can, you can have multiple users and you have up to 40 channels to utilize. Just keep in mind that certain channels, even in the government, are, are emergency channels reserved. Um, so like uh, for us, some of our channels like nine are reserved for emergency. Um, some of them, like I think two is reserved for fire, um, you know, in case of that type of emergency. And that's kind of our backup system because you're right, Ignatius. Cell towers are down. You're relying upon that tech system. And now suddenly you don't have it. Now it's your good old fashioned, you know, old CB systems that truck drivers use and truckers use, you know, suddenly now it becomes the norm for everyone. Um, and that usually is your only response. You GPS works sometimes and sometimes satellite phones, but because of the busy nature of the emergency, you're restricted on bandwidth, like I talked about too. Yeah. Because I, I remember trying to get, um, somebody has a question. Go ahead, please. Yes. 
one of the things I was going to ask Juan is um, about the disaster now we're dealing with COVID as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, before we started, we have a wildfire uh, raging in British Columbia right now and uh, a friend of mine was just evacuated. And normally we would be using a community center, schools to put up cots, but they can't do that because of COVID. So how does that play into this mix here? Uh, so the, the traditional response to that, and I always look at other countries that have been through these, and believe it or not, uh, and I, I'm gonna mention them, is when it comes to COVID and pandemic response, um, one of the, the biggest leaders is uh, Taiwan. Um, they had SARS hit hard by SARS uh, 10 years ago. They have their own pandemic system. They have not closed their borders. And simply is, is they went to mask using immediately. Uh, as of January, they shut down their borders and they've been on, on full pandemic mask wearing right from January on, and they have not, uh, one, their, their economy is still running full course. They haven't closed schools, they haven't closed anything down. Um, so mask wearing, we know is not 100% effective, but it's 90 plus effective, 90% plus effective. And that reduces a lot of the airborne viruses and airborne uh, things that can happen. Same thing with wastewater and, and flood scenarios, where you start getting mold, mold and those spores um, that, uh, that bring out. Those masks will help you not, it's not 100%, but it will help you more than it won't, if that makes any sense. It does much better. Um, and yeah, with the fires and stuff like that too, and now you're, you're close proximity, you have no choice. Um, Taiwan's class, uh, they're still running 20 to 30 people per class. Uh, like it's never changed. The only difference is they're all mask wearing. They're all have hygiene. They're all washing hands. Um, you know, they all had these protocols in place and they've been trained 10 years ago. They've been trained throughout. And now to them, it's, it's, it's easier to make that transition than it is a country like us that is not ready for that yet. You don't see many people wearing masks and we do. It's like, why are you wearing a mask? You know, back there, that's the norm because they already had to put up with all that already. They've had to go through a bad SARS um, um, epidemic, uh, pandemic. So um, yeah, mask wearing is, is your, your best case, washing your hands, uh, refraining from, uh, you know, touching your face, you know, everything that we've been hearing all about from, you know, CDC and from our own ministries of health uh, is, is all the same, same type of precautions that we need to take in place. Only now, instead of suggested, you just have to make it mandatory. Um, and then only then will it be um, safe to, to have people in bigger groups, if that makes any more sense. Does that help answer your question, Valerie? Thank you. And I think as well, planning what they're planning, they're, they're utilizing all the hotels. Uh, our hotel reservation got cancelled because oh, they're okay. using all the hotels so that they can socially distance people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we have a question in the chat um, yes. from Derek Jones. Um, it says, what technology would you, you recommend for distances beyond six kilometers? Um, if you're beyond six kilometers, you have to use, yeah. so what we did on our team is we ended up, um, we ended up with, uh, something that's, um, in Canada is, is not, um, how do you say legal? Um, we actually have booster stations that we have. So a portable booster stations that will boost our signal another six or 10 kilometers. Um, and then what we do is as we, so our, our, our plan is if, when we start rescuing, we, we start with our EOC, which is our, our uh, emergency uh, center, right? Emergency operations center. And then from there on, we expand out six kilometers and then we start putting out what we call either repeaters or boosters. And that boosts our signal a little bit further and then boosts the signal a little bit further. Most of them are battery operated and will last three or four weeks on, on proper battery power. So we tend to expand our, our um, booster capability. And we're not just boosting our signal, we're boosting any, any signal that runs in these same 40 channel frequencies or in our same Wi-Fi system. So within building that, not only do we have um, standard two-way communication booster, uh, we also have Wi-Fi boosters for our own Wi-Fi system because a lot of things are pictures and texts, um, just like you mentioned, um, uh, Ignatius, about your cell phones. We wanna be able to have that capability. So we built a Wi-Fi system into that as well that can go even further range but it's technology that's ever-changing, getting even better, and it's portable systems that you have to boost your signal. So you have to look at that technology, what's available in your country, what, what geographical areas that are gonna interfere with that, like mountains obviously interfere with the, the signal direction, um, and where you can place a booster and how far will it go. And because in our case for emergency response, we wanna make sure not only are we getting detail of what they found, how many per people they found or anything like that, it's also send me a picture of the disaster. 
and then we can look at that picture and we can make as a as a command center a much better educated decision on that if that makes any sense so we don't want just verbal communication which is what our first first line of, of communication ends up becoming we also as we put these repeaters and these boosters out there and wi-fi boosters um, we end up uh, uh, with pictures and more detail uh, of the uh, of the actual emergency so i hope that answers your question um quick question yes uh, yeah how did you determine where to set up your command center um my uh um e eoc centers sorry yes please. um yeah so that's an interesting part so we basically looked at you know what are what our natural disasters are for so for us it's it's earthquake for for you guys it could be earthquake as well because i know you guys have those as well but we looked for the safest area of where it's going to cause the least amount of damage um, and, you know, one of the stronger buildings that have been known to, you know, um, be able to withstand, say, a certain amount of category, whatever it is. And that becomes our station. And we have multiple EOC or uh, multiple centers or uh, emergency operation centers, not just one. So we'll have uh, one center located here, 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 and here. And then basically out of those four centers, we're going to put a priority list. So everyone has a priority list. That This is the first center we're going to go to. If that's un unachievable, we're going to go to the next one. If that's unachievable, we're going to go to the next one. And what we're looking at is not only is it going to be sound and structurally sound, um, the other thing that we have to consider is too is it's close enough to resources that we, can, that we need. Is it close enough to access to transportation, logistics, that we can get around a little easier? And is it close enough to our emergency um, area where we'd have to do uh, to our population, but not far enough from a population where it might affect the operation itself? So there's a lot of things to consider, and that usually comes from a risk assessment or hazard assessment of of, uh, of an exercise. And and we determined our our EOC just by simply doing a tabletop exercise, like I mentioned. And once we started discussing it, we realized that there are certain areas that just aren't the best that we thought would be, um, and we had to change our mind because now we had different people at the table that had a different perspective, different point of view, and some of them we never even thought about. So um, like where our, uh, where our fiber goes to and, and hub, fiber hubs, some, some fiber hubs are better, better locations than others. So I hope that kind of answers your question, but it's, it's hard to really say one area is better than the other. You got to look at the whole area, look at the disaster, look at what could potentially happen, look at low lying areas, high lying areas, and then find out what are you closest to, and then start making a list of you know, this is my best, this is where I should have an EOC. This would be the next best place for an EOC. This is the third, this is the fourth, this is the fifth, whatever it takes for you to have that control. And if one doesn't work, we go to two. And everybody has that list so they know, oh, shoot, nobody's going there, so we got to go to the next one. Hope that helps. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, awesome. Right. Um, do we have any other questions? I, I think this is... Um, the, the other thing was to do with the... We, we were speaking about, we mentioned the telecoms, um, and we, you mentioned some of this, the storage for, um, materials that you should have um, in place. I don't know if you want to just, um, not elaborate. to elaborate, but just to maybe we'll just re-examine um, that bit of it. Some of the contents of the container, I think you mentioned the storage of essential yeah. materials. That you yeah, would so, and, and supply. Yeah, well, certainly. Um, so, yeah, we, we uh, have containers. Um, so, what we, we identified is we have a couple of uh, places, and, and I'll go through what we already. So, our main one's going to be um, flooding uh, and earthquakes. That's our main one. So, on high ground, we have a couple of old water tanks. They haven't been put into usage, but they are still there. And, and for us to take it down from municipality is expensive but they're not perfect. Some of them leak, some of them have problems. What we did is we filled them up. We made them engineering sound, we plugged the holes, we filled them up, and we use it for emergency storage water. And it's not to drink by no means, but it could be easily used uh, in case of uh, disaster. Um, and we can just use that for other things. Like there's a lot of other things that water need to be used at, not just drinking. Um, our drinking water is where were the containers. So the containers were sealed drinking water containers that are good for five years. And, and even those we didn't, we put in all kinds of pills, like iodine pills and chlorine pills, so that we can utilize that in, in boiled water. Because you got to think too, if you don't have water available or you need to, you have water that's questionable, you're going to have to be able to put some of these pills into it to kill any type of bacteria or viruses that might be contained in there. Boiling water usually does a good job, but it's not 100% on everything. So you got to keep that in, in mind too. So, um, so a good thing is, is that uh, just make sure that, you know, 
your essentials are, and that's your water is your essential piece, right? Air we breathe, obviously, first. Water, um, food, and it's usually canned goods or anything that's, uh, you know, high energy, high, high um, uh, carb, um, nutrient-based. Um, obviously, fruit and vegetables are out the window, so it has to be something that can survive or last for, for four or five years. And, and MERs or uh, um, MREs, pardon me, uh, military rations are, are sometimes the, that choice, which I actually have a box of it in my garage. Um, is sometimes a choice and then blankets um, and then medical supplies and lots of medical supplies. So we got to think about the people that are going to come there. They're going to be hurt and injured and it could be minor. We got to have a lot of medical supplies, you know, minor pills um, to help anything like that because surprisingly, you know, even an aspirin can help better than nothing at all. Um, so those are essentials in there. And then we have a couple of uh, rescue things that we put in there, extra communication pieces that we put into our containers in case something fails, uh, extra battery systems, generator and, and, um, and gas is usually there, which usually gets pulled out, maintained every, I guess every month. I think they go to the container, they pull out some of the devices, start them up, run them for five or 10 minutes, put them back in and can carry on. But it's maintaining those type of systems. And those containers are placed throughout cities, municipalities, and in, in painted bright red, bright red and have you know emergency put on it for emergency purposes only type thing. And they're locked up, obviously. Um, that's the other thing, because we have to worry about theft. So, um, so the access to these is, is uh, also restricted. So it makes it interesting, but that's basically what we've done with ours, our system. So, Ron, if I could add something to that, because in the disasters I've worked in in the Caribbean, um, yes. the utilities have to also think about theft of their goods. I know in Dominica, their stores were looted right afterwards and they lost everything. They had nothing left. Uh, chainsaws was, were a big deal. We needed a lot of chainsaws. Uh, mm -hmm. because there was so much debris around. Before we could get to anywhere, we needed the chainsaws to be able to, uh, to cut through the, all the debris. So making sure what you talked about in the home um, and emergency supplies is that the utility has to be looking at the possibility of theft and how they are storing their supplies and making them secure. Um, so that's another yep. thing I think. Yeah, it's a huge piece and you're right, Valerie. It's a, it's a huge piece. Um, I, I can't say for, you know, how someone's going to protect that system, but um, yeah, we have uh, in our cash, uh, yeah, we have tons of saws and all kinds of different things and, and chainsaws and, and things to get through and breaking bars and wrecking bars and, and you name it, because that's just part of our cash. Um, and some of those things that have to be stored in certain areas too, um, and protecting it is definitely a huge piece. Um, you know, our containers are well, lit, all well um, painted, but they're also in strategic locations. And some locations, only the public works knows where they are. So not the, the public itself does not know where these containers are, just so everybody's aware of. The containers are actually only the public works uh, departments and emergency responders and, and management know where these containers actually are. Um, a lot of them are secured uh, for that reason being, is that we don't want anybody to get into them. Um, but in many cases, and, and like they did in Hurricane Katrina, is Walmart helped out and offered their store and people went into Walmart, even though they had to go through two or three feet of water uh, to get inside the store, they had a whole bunch of supplies and Walmart opened the door and said, help yourself to whatever you have in there because most of it's going to be no good anyway. Um, and uh, they got a lot of their stuff from that. I think it was a Lowe's um, they got from another hardware store. They went there and got a whole bunch of stuff too. So sometimes resources around you may be what you're going to need to bring into your, your disaster. Um, think about uh, the hardware stores close by and the grocery stores close by because there might be some of the resources that you're going to need as well. Yeah. Um, of course, there, there are lots of lessons learned um, <clears throat> after Hurricanes Maria in more recent time in Dominica and, and um, in St. Lucia after Hurricane Thomas. So I think a lot of the utilities have learned the lessons of storage and in, in distributing a lot of the stored material in, in strategic locations around the islands because there have been cases where you may have landslides which would prevent any thought of form of more trouble access to some locations. So they have um, been able to do that. And in other smaller situations, I've been able to respond even better because of the lessons learned. But still, I think what you presented this afternoon was of tremendous value. And of course, we have recorded it for posterity and can share for those who missed um, the session. So I don't know if there are any further questions or any comments by the participants. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I'll just add one more thing is, um, look at what's in your country. Um, so uh, look at what's in your country, uh, find out what they have for the resources already, find out what they have for an emergency response plan, and just add yourself to that. 
So if you're a public works department, add yourself to that city and that municipality's um, emergency response process. You know, be a part of that process and make sure that you're included in that process. Um, and to get some learn, uh, take, you know, I recommend ICS 100. I know we talked about this in Asia, and you guys have been yeah. very gracious at, at presenting that and offering it. Um, that's a great course to take that just opens and expands your knowledge and, and check out others. Lots of web pages out there, whether government web pages that have lots of emergency preparedness stuff that you can take a look at both from a municipal aspect, countrywide aspect, as well as from a civilian uh, or uh, public access. Um, so it gives you lots of different resources out there and, and lessons learned, like you said, Ignatius, from things that's already happened, you know, learn lessons. And then hopefully next time we're better prepared. Are we going to be 100% prepared for everything? No. I mean, there's so many uncertainties out there, but we're going to at least be better prepared. And really that's essentially what we got to do. As the old saying goes that um, an ounce of prevention is better than an ounce of cure. And to be always be prepared as a good boy scout. So, I think um, this, this is very useful. Uh, I Yes, indeed, we have the ICS 100, just to remind participants who missed the last course. We're going to be offering it again on the 2nd of September from 1 p.m. Um, to about 4, 4 p.m. So you do, um, we will send out the invitation so you can always register and let your friends know for those who have missed it. And then next week's session, um, it's going to be the 26th. We're going to be back on a Wednesday. I apologize for anybody who missed because we had a, a situation that we were not able to run the, sem the webinar yesterday. But we are going to be back on Wednesday, the 26th, from 4 to 5 p.m. And we have a guest um, who's going to present on, uh, I think it is, managing concrete deterioration in wastewater treatment plants so look out for that we will be circulating the the links by tomorrow or later this evening so i'd like to thank you very much ron and valerie and madeleine for giving us that support all the way from canada and operators without borders continuing to be a good partner with us we're delighted to be so, Ignatius. Thank you. And thank you. Thank all you. All. Thank you, Madeline, and thank you, Ron. All thank the you best. Very much. And you. I'd like to thank all our participants from across the Caribbean. And you have a wonderful evening. I will stay be safe. in the recordings very shortly. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.